Okay, welcome to week four. Um, this is our lecture for the week. And we're going to be talking about uh, site work primarily. Uh, when I do my lectures or anything, actually, I kind of like to do things in the order that we do them normally. And if we're talking about building construction or any type of construction, uh, certainly the site is one of the first considerations we need to look at. This quote, thousands of engineers can design bridges, calculate strains and stresses, and draw up specifications for machines. But the great engineer is the person who can tell whether the bridge or the machine should be built at all, where it should be built, and when. Um, and, th and I think that's, that's kind of important because, uh, uh, you know, we can think of engineering as just doing the calculations and the strains, but you really have a personal... Um, uh, input into the, the finished product and none of us want to create something that people are not going to be happy with in the end so uh, we try to make our compromises and our decisions based on our best uh, abilities to, um, to please as many people as we can and make sure things are going to be safe and, and, uh, and usable. So the first thing we do when we look at uh, as a site is is start analyzing um, the buildable areas, um, the soils, uh, the grades, the slopes. If we look at this photo up here, um, you can see a wetland area. You can see where this swale has come through. This is obviously some previous agricultural uh, fields. And because this was a wet area, it's been uh, left unplowed, so to speak. And we can see that greenery coming down through. So we know there's kind of a brook running down through here. We can see there's an existing road running in this direction. So down here in the development, we see that this water feature has been kept. There's a bridge or some type of uh, uh, water retention system to create a pond or a park area. They've left this brook running down through here so we maintain this wetland um, looks like a housing development going in so what they've done is basically taken this aerial photograph and, and traced over it used the same perspective to give a before and after shot of what the development might look like after the fact um, so it's a new new community um, we're going to take a look at the town of Orono here in a short while uh, uh, regarding uh, building ordinances and zoning uh, uh, applications. So we'll look at some of those definitions. Land use and site plan uh, planning begins with the client. The client describes their objectives and plans. It could be a single building, could be a bridge, could be a road. Um, it could be just about anything and works with you throughout the project. You're in constant communication with the owner or the client as to what they're looking for and your job is to make sure you, you give them as much as they can get within their budget. Three major phases, research and analysis, design and implementation. I think we, with building information modeling, we can probably take that to a fourth step where it's uh, um, uh, actually uh, not beyond the implementation we're actually looking at the life cycle of the building uh, maintenance and uh, um, and final uh, you know basically recycling of whatever is being built uh, in the future so this could be two or three steps beyond these three major phases but initially we're looking at research and analysis design of the building or structure and implementation Research and analysis involves looking at what we know, uh, looking at definitions, um, terminologies, and we'll look at some of that in a little bit. Community involvement, meet with people in relevant groups. Uh, and, and, and I probably, let me go back here just a second. Um, recently in the news, we saw um, a company that came to the town of Orono with a plan to reopen an old um, pit, uh, gravel pit. I think they were going to be hauling gravel out of this place. And um, 
it was relatively close to uh, what is known as the Orono Bog Walk. And immediately there was a, an outroar, uh, an up, uproar, I should say, uh, a cry for, oh no, we can't have that because it's going to create dust and it's going to ruin our wetland and it's going to be noisy and it's going to make our peace and quiet go away. We've got this beautiful park out here where people come and enjoy it and we get 50,000 people a year walking on our boardwalk and we're going to have this these dynamite explosions going off and big trucks with their with their tailgates uh, making huge noise and scaring the birds and salamanders and uh, you know it's just not right. Uh, we get the, the NIMBY, um, the, the, the group not in my backyard. It's probably a fine, uh, 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 you know, industry. Uh, there will be some noise, there'll be some dust. It was previously a gravel pit, but suddenly we have this park next door to it with the people that are very concerned about keeping it pristine and quiet and, and nice. And even though they don't own the land, they can create quite an uproar. So the the people probably with the least to lose or gain are usually the ones that have the largest voice if it's impacting something that is near them. If that gravel pit was 10 miles away in a different community, uh, we can all doubt very much that they would have much of an opposition to it. But because it happened to be in the area of the Orono Bog Walk, uh, it became an issue, and and eventually the developer withdrew his application to uh, to construct that gravel pit. So, first of all, meeting with people in relevant groups is important, and it's important to have a plan on how to manage the information that they get, and uh, making sure that they fully understand what the outcome is going to be and if there are some issues with noise or dust or or um, light pollution all of those things you know there's probably ways to address them um, but the communication needs to start there we have our state and federal level requirements our DEP people Department of Environmental Protection within the state uh, are going to be looking for environmental impacts of the development whatever it happens to be, whether it's going to impact wetlands, um, wildlife, um, anything that might cause issues outside of the development are going to be looked at. Um, so those are important. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, other agencies that are necessary to get in and take a look at these things may be required at both the state and federal level. Local requirements are part of the comprehensive plans for land use, zoning, standard designs for roadways, drainage, water, wastewater, and utilities, which are all known factors. We just need to educate ourselves on what those are. And each community may be a little bit different. Here's a, uh, a map of the town of Orono zoning map, which is, uh, which is pretty, it, it's pretty good. We can see over here is Pushaw Lake. Uh, in some of these colors, you see the brown, well, let's just get down through it, F and A, which is this large light um, uh, teal color, is all forestry and agri agri agriculture, is the way it's zoned. Uh, MDR is medium density residential, so we can see between I-95, this is I-95 south, the two exits, uh, here's the University of Maine, all of these white colored areas are medium density residential. We have high density residential. We have one area right here, which is where I believe the apartments are located. Uh, and one little area down in here, which is another group of apartments. So that's high density. You have a lot of people living in a relatively small area. The, uh, the blue is village commercial. This is downtown Orono. Um, all of the shops, Pat's Pizza, everything is within this little blue area. C1 is commercial one. Uh, let's see, that's back in here. So this would be um, up by the second exit where um, all of the, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts and the uh, Dice Hearts and some of the stores are located. And, uh, and part of uh, that also continues out into the Old Town section up in here. 
uh, Commercial 2 down in this area. This is just across from uh, the back of the university. We have the banks located in here. The new apartment complexes are actually located in the Commercial 2 district. EDZ is Economic Development Zone. Now what does that mean? Not really sure, but we'll take a look at it in a minute. But uh, these are economic development zones, or apparently areas that the town of Orono is probably looking to develop into uh, tax paying entities. Uh, we have the town's nemesis, the University of Maine, uh, non tax paying entity, uh, which is kind of a thorn in the, uh, in the side of the town of Orono because we do not pay taxes to the town of Orono because we are an educational facility. Uh, so it makes it difficult. Um, they are working through different ways to work with us. We have industrial zoned. A few places that are industrial zone, maybe down in this island area. Uh, conditional zoning, CL, and we have a few of those maybe down in here. We'd have to look at the map. And then we have an aquifer protection overlay district, which is this light uh, blue. And that may be down along this shoreline area. May all be um, water or what aquifer uh, protection. Um, shoreland zoning, we have limited commercial district. Resource Protection District, which is the green, any of these green areas are resource protections, limited residential, and general development. We have a scale on this drawing. Uh, we have who did the work, the um, all of the information, the towns bordering it are located here. And this is the Stillwater River running down through here, and then the Penobscot River where it picks up, and this is Ayers Island, I believe, out in this area. If we look a little further, I've put a hyperlink on here to the Orno Zoning Definitions area. So we're going to take a look at that on their website, which is kind of interesting. If we look down at the land use area, so if you're looking to develop something in the town of Orno, you'd want to go to their ordinance section and look under land use. And we can see, first of all, they have an area for it. Uh, general provisions and then definitions and word usage which is really kind of interesting I was looking at this a little earlier all of the terms that they would use in uh, a uh, report or article are listed in here so we basically have a, a dictionary of terms that are used by the municipality to determine uh, what an abutter is. An abutter means an owner of property bordering a subject lot or parcel of land. So if somebody is wants to build something, you may need to contact all of the abutters of that property to make sure that they know what is going on. Um, even to the point where we're looking at adult businesses for adult bookstores or video stores or even strip joints are all listed out and defined in this area aquaculture, antenna heights, uh, barnyard animals, what that entails. So it includes any animal kept for the consumption, sale, pleasure, or as worker animals such as cattle, horses, pigs, sheep, chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, goats, mules, hogs, and other like animals. Uh, whether you could bring an elephant into your yard may be questionable uh, unless you're using it as a uh, logging uh, instrument, but you know. Um, if you're sitting in a, in a meeting and somebody says we need to look at the basal area, um, that is just means the cross section of a tree stem at four and a half feet above ground level and inclusive of bark. So the basal area would be determining how big a tree, you know, maybe you could cut down or take out if it's in a, a in a protected area. Flood zones and basement areas, everything is listed out here, including types of facilities, child care centers, church. Uh, civic centers, clubs, clubhouses, condominiums, everything is listed and given a definition. So if there's a question, you can come here and find out what that involves. For instance, if we're looking at something that might have some water related, let's look at the definition of direct watershed of a great pond means the portion of the watershed which drains directly to the great pond without first passing through an upstream great pond. For the purposes of these regulations, the watershed boundaries shall be as delineated in the comprehensive plan. And 
And due to the scale of the map and the comprehensive plan, there may be small inaccuracies in the delinea delineation of this watershed boundary. Where there's a dispute as to the exact location of a watershed boundary, the board or its designee engineer and the applicant shall conduct an on-site investigation to determine where the drainage divide lies. If the board and the applicant cannot agree on the location of the drainage divide based on the on-site investigation, the burden of, of proof shall lie with the applicant to provide the board with information from a registered land surveyor showing where the drainage line uh, divide lies. Um, basically, uh, you got to prove it to them. So these types of things go all the way through and there's just a ton of different definitions and it's a great um, ability to, um, to, to look at uh, um, the definitions. And if you're at a meeting or if somebody brings up a word you don't understand and you don't feel like you want to ask them, great place to come and look that stuff up. I found a word in here earlier, I think it was in the C's, didn't know what it meant, which was kind of interesting. A, um, let's see if I can find it here. I think it was C, uh, collo collocation. I think that's how it's pronounced. Collocation means the use of a wireless communications facility by more than one wireless communication provider. In this case, it's, it's also used for things like satellites, but collocation would involve a tower that has multiple wireless communication devices on it. So there's a lot of different entities that are using that tower. So that would be referred to as a collocation. If it was brought up in a conversation, I would have, wouldn't have had a clue. But now we know if they're talking collocation, we're talking about groups of different entities in one particular location or using one facility. So again, you can kind of look through these. I won't, uh, won't go through them too much. If we go back now to our land use again and take a look at zoning districts. And here we're going to get a, a definition of all of those zoning districts, commercial one and commercial two. Let's see if we can find out what the difference is between commercial one and commercial two. And here it is. Um, commercial one district, the purpose of the commercial one C1 zone district is to provide for a mix of large scale and small scale. I'm going to resize this so it fits in our viewing frame a little bit better. Oops, try to anyway. There we go. Hopefully you can see that a little better. Now I gotta find it. There we go. Whoops. Too far. Commercial commercial district one. The purpose of commercial district one provides uh, for a mix of large scale and smaller commercial establishments. Development in the C1 zone in the vicinity of exit 51 is intended to encourage development which would contribute significantly to the town's tax base and create positive visual impacts including attractive architecture and landscaping. Commercial District 2 is district is to allow a mix of residential and compatible small-scale commercial and residential establishments. So there could be apartment buildings or uh, other types of things in that area that include both residential, there could be a small restaurant, a little bistro, that type of thing. I know we've got a Thai restaurant built out of a garage up on uh, Route 2 amongst all of the houses and whatnot. So that could be in Commercial District 2. An economic development zone we looked at before is the purpose of an economic development zone is to allow light industry, office buildings, research and development, and forestry and agriculture utilizing buffering standards to protect adjacent residential properties. The intent of the district is to encourage development which would contribute significantly to the town's tax base and create positive visual impacts including attractive architecture and landscaping. So it's just an area that they're looking to develop to become possibly a commercial one district at some point. But it, there's certain buffering that needs to be done to um, uh, to, to separate it from a, um, uh, a residential zone. When we talk about zoning itself, um, we need to look at the, um, the impact that not having zoning would have. And... I would point to a state like New Hampshire, which in the past has not had, in my mind anyway, very good zoning ordinances. And you'll see 
oh, a trailer park and a residential and a, and a business and, and then another resident and a business. Uh, putting those things in particular areas really has an impact on creating a, um, um, a, a, a municipal area that really has some good uh, divided areas that you don't have um, somebody doing industrial work next to a residence in most cases. In some of your older towns, of course, you, you still may get into that, but certainly these things are uh, make for a better looking community if you can kind of keep your your uh, industrial districts in one area and your residential districts in another and your commercial districts in another and just try to divide those things out and make those consistent and that way your utilities and all your infrastructure can kind of be geared towards that type of an environment. Another thing that the uh, um, so this is definitions of what those zones include so if you're looking to develop an area you want to be looking at how it's zoned first of all um, and how that would work if we go back to the um, let's see if I can go back to the, the um, just the regular town of Orono I thought I had a let's see if I can just click it here there we go the other thing I noticed on uh, on Orono's website um, is information that you know some people here's uh, they had some other things on here earlier that uh, involved that that um, gravel pit but they may have taken it off now anyway I'll stick to the subject here the GIS maps um, geographic information system maps if we click on this uh, it's kind of a cool tool um, and it brings up the the uh, tax parcels within the Orono City so Here's that same map that we just looked at, and let's say we're looking for somebody, and I happen to know, I don't live in Orono myself, but if I know somebody, here's uh, um, some of you taking classes with Edwin Nagy, let's invade his privacy, and just type in Nagy, and we'll search it. We can see there's Edwin, he lives on 2 Woodland Drive. Uh, we can see that his property is .83 acres, he's on lot 56. Uh, on Woodland Drive and uh, uh, account number 2148 object ID doesn't give his phone number and I can't really tell whether he's paid his taxes or not just yet um, but it basically is a location if I have a parcel of land I want to know who owns that parcel of land here's a quick and easy way to do it I can zoom out a little bit here and see uh, where on Woodland Drive he's actually located there's Bennick Road, Noise Drive, Sunrise, and Woodland. So if I wanted to to swing by Edwin's and uh, and uh, check in with him, then I could uh, pretty easily find find his house. Not something um, uh, you know to be used in a bad way, but certainly it's a tool to determine property. Uh, locations and GIS is a great way so if this changes it would automatically update this database uh, rental registrations I'm not sure I've never these are building this is where rental units and uh, select parcels in zone C2 um, let's look under medium density residential and see how many have two or more units and see the search I'm just making this stuff up and it's going to give me a map of all the rental units with two units in them. Um, here's one Main Street Apartments LLC. Uh, Mohammed Musavi, who works in the engine department. I didn't know he had rental units, but let's check it out and see where it's at. He's got a rental unit over on lot 12. It's a half acre lot uh, just off uh, Littlefield Lane. 
So he has some type of an apartment there, or at least it's been registered as an apartment in the back in the past. So just a, just kind of a cool tool that you can use, and this is all stuff that you can investigate. Uh, consider yourself a private investigator when you're starting your development. You can find out all of this information really quickly and easily. We could snag all these graphics if we wanted to to put them in our own map and and use those as part of what we're doing. Uh, so it's just just kind of a neat uh, neat thing to do. So. Let's get back to our PowerPoint and start looking again at site analysis beyond what we found out initially. We're going to do a, a survey data which will include topography with contour lines, shows us existing elevations, where the existing structures and utilities are in the building. We're going to look at aerial photographs. Of course, we've got Google Earth and Flash Earth now that we can look at. Um, for suburban considerations, we're going to look at soil types, steep or moderate slopes, sun and wind exposure for solar energy, flood zones, water runoff patterns, um, road access and suitability, traffic generation, ecological conservation, plants and animals, location of ledge, uh, adjacent property uses and compatibility, and noise and light pollution. We're not going to put a big light up, uh, street light outside somebody's uh, bedroom window and not expect to get a phone call from them. So all things that we need to uh, uh, consider. And then urban considerations are somewhat different. Here's an example of a site analysis map where we're looking at, this is uh, apparently in the town of Hamden. It's, uh, it's like it's 165 acres, it's got some wetlands in this blue, and we've got some steep slopes running down into that wetland on this particular piece of property. So the areas that could possibly be developed are rather limited on this large parcel of land, but nonetheless it could, uh, you, you know, this is where you'd start looking for the best place to start putting whatever structure you're looking to put in without draining the swamp. Environmental site analysis slope and soils, erosion control, adequate for plants, vegetation and wildlife, tolerance to construction activities, indigenous species, wildlife movements. We don't want to uh, knock out the, we don't want to take out a, a winter, a deer's wintering yard for whitetails. We don't want to mess with a spotted salamander's uh, habitat, or at least we want to make sure that we're not going to impact it with what we're doing. Um, otherwise, we're going to get the you know, the people coming after us, uh, the community. The geology, the subsurface, water, natural drainage patterns, wetlands, climate, uh, potential effects of construction on wind, sun, sometimes just taking out a clearing of trees. And I've talked to some of our foresters where uh, we asked about uh, taking out some of the large pine trees in our forest area to uh, uh, to make room for a building and uh, one of the things you discover is some of those big old pine trees some of those big trees are actually holding each other up so the minute you take some of those out and create an opening um, the fact that a tree has been holding up another tree for a long time all of a sudden that's not there then the first windstorm you get you may end up with trees falling so they foresters are a good resource to go to to find out what type of clearing is adequate that we don't end up with trees falling on power lines or on buildings or cross roads um, and take, make sure we take out enough material that it's not going to cause an issue later on. All the data is in the CAD levels in our drawing files so that we can turn things on and off, identify buildings, assess environmental impact, see the wetlands, the big picture, see the details, be able to zoom in on certain areas, and this is all can be done within one file. As far as subsurface, here's a, a drawing I just pulled off the, uh, the internet of a uh, building footprint of some type. I'm not even sure what it is. Uh, these look like building lots, and it looks like they want to build some kind of a large structure here. It could be an apartment building. I don't really know what it is. But these are boring logs, and the first thing that you want to do once you've got an established site that you want to build on is get a uh, technician out there, an engineer, to do some soil borings. Find out, number one, what the composition of the soils are, what the bearing capacity is of those soils, and what kind of obstacles you might run into, i.e. ledge, granite, 
Um, sometimes that little boulder that's sticking out of the ground uh, a couple of feet wide can be just the tip of the iceberg and that may extend all the way across the building lot so that uh, your foundations may be impacted and then we're talking large cost for uh, blasting or redesigning the foundation to the point where uh, it would no longer have any subsurface support it would just be supported off the ledge itself which isn't a bad thing but uh, one of the things in in site development is we're looking for uh, uniform um, uh, settling uh, of the building if you put one part of your building on ledge and the other part is on footings that might be in a, a silt or clay or something less stable um, less fr frost resistant um, you could end up with some uh, differential settlement is what we call it in the uh, fact that this part of the building stays where it is but during the, 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 the cold cycles and the freezing and thawing cycles this building shifts a little bit just a, just a tiny bit that concrete doesn't bend and we end up with cracks in our foundation walls uh, and other problems with the building doors that won't shut windows that won't shut uh, floors that are crooked and suddenly we're into a problem. I think uh, some of you may have noticed the uh, the article in the uh, Bangor Daily a few weeks ago about the coals in I think it's Saco or Scarborough that they're tearing down and having to rebuild uh, in a smaller footprint because the soils underneath were such that the building was actually sinking into the ground. Uh, it doesn't take much and over a number of years a building can settle um, and just cause issues and that differential settlement if one if the building isn't completely in one particular soil type uh, that needs to be accounted for in the foundation so we'd hire an engineer to come out and do something you can see the symbols down here at the bottom is these are proposed boring locations there was also some existing boring locations this one's LB4 and it also gives us the depth LB7 was a boring that went to 100 feet uh, LB8 went to 80 feet. Sometimes they use uh, a drill, a core drill. Other times they use what's called a cat head um, uh, imp, uh, ram that actually drops the pipe with hammer blows. So it drops a weighted hammer head onto a pipe and they keep track of how many blows it takes to get through the soil. Uh, so for every blow they measure how many inches that pipe moved or fractions of an inch. Uh, so it may be 20 blows to get a foot um, down in the ground with that weighted and that determines that helps them determine somewhat of the uh, load capacity of the soil by doing that once they've drilled these holes um, or pounded the holes down and taken the soil samples each of these holes would would get a report and that report would look something like this and then again this is just something it doesn't have anything to do with the previous drawing but a similar that hole would here's boring number GP01 uh, not even this is uh, location is Victor New York and we can see a profile of our soil here at there's 2.3 feet this is the sample type recovery number so they took a sample at 2.3 feet uh, top uh, two or three feet was dark brown sand and some silt organics in the top foot then they ran into some coarse gravel sub-rounded loose below that they found some sand and coarse angular gravel and then below that they found brown sand and medium coarse rounded gravel loose and wet um, down to five at five feet all the way down to 12 feet they started hitting sand and medium coarse sub-rounded gravel trace a silt and find sand at the bottom loose and wet and then at 15 feet they found three inches of sand that they recovered um, and that three inches went down and at 20 feet there was no recovery so this hole just went down 20 feet groundwater depth was at four feet ground surface uh, date of the measurement drilling was a direct push this was being hammered right in uh, I'm not sure exactly what a direct push uh, tells who the driller was um, when they started, when they finished, uh, the datum was in feet, um, and uh, this is just the project number up here. So for each of those uh, 
boring locations, we'd receive a report. But once that report is done, you can kind of create a visual profile of what that soil is going to be and determine with that information your foundation subcontractor or your, you yourself as a foundation person would be able to determine how much effort and work is going to have to go into the foundation construction and it would help the structural engineer also in designing the footings, designing the wall thickness, designing the reinforcing steel that needs to go into that, where the column locations are going to be, to make sure that that building stays just as stable as possible within the environment that it's being uh, constructed. Once that's done and we've got all our DEP permits working and everything looks good, we're going to start a de design phase where the package comes together, uh, all the professional drawings and graphics are done, the preliminary and alternate plans are created. Uh, we go to public review. We say, okay, here's our plan. This is what we'd like to build, a new parking garage outside the university for students with a shuttle service and a or a zip line or something to get them to class so they don't have to walk and all this stuff for the faculty and uh, we're going to build it and we want to take that to the public and um, we've notified the abutters they've received the letter that there's going to be a public meeting and with their drawings that are there for their review and they need to come in well some people may come in with traffic concerns others may come in with noise concerns Certainly some may come in with light pollution if their home is next door to this parking garage and um, you know it starts becoming a skateboard park instead of a parking garage uh, just because of the slopes in the floor and uh, uh, it could happen. So anything that's negative that could possibly happen is going to be brought up at that meeting and it needs to be addressed. Uh, it needs to be looked at, it needs to be discussed and that communication is essential to make sure that um, people are at least um, uh, satisfied that their that that their um, input is being recognized, uh, regardless of whether it might be trivial uh, to you. It may seem trivial to them. It's probably a big deal. Uh, so everything needs to be looked at looked at seriously uh, and and um, professionally in order to uh, keep the project moving. Um, or make whatever adjustments are necessary to uh, to keep you know people happy. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the university uh, re renovated the Alphond Arena, um, put in a new ice making system, and included a dehumidification system because we are having some issues with mold building up on the ceiling. It was so damp in there with the ice and whatnot. Uh, so we put in a large dehumidification system, and that's those uh, white round duck socks that run along the ceiling and uh, the mechanics for those are on the far end of the building and we put it in and we tried to make sure that it was uh, fenced in um, but what we didn't realize at the time was that it was going to be relatively noisy and in the summertime when people over on Charles Street uh, had their windows opening they could hear this constant humming noise from the dehumidification system and it caused them some irritation. So um, we had to work. This was after the fact, of course, because we had no idea it was going to be an issue until we actually started up the system. It wasn't supposed to be as loud. Of course, the the people that sold it to us told us it wouldn't be loud. It wouldn't be in, anything of a problem. But then there are some people that are extremely sensitive to these types of things. And, uh, you know, there are some people that just like to complain. And when they complain, we need to respond to them because we are a public institution. And uh, we researched it. We found some uh, sound absorbing panels that we could hang inside the fence to absorb sound. Uh, we extended the stacks up higher. We did some things engineering wise to make that system quieter and I believe we've taken care of the problem. So sometimes even after the building is up we need to look at things that have come up that we maybe didn't anticipate but uh, we need to address them just to just to keep everybody uh, uh, relatively happy. When we look at road design, um, we have certain standards that we need to look at. I, this picture was part of Will's stuff. I'm not really sure what this what this stick is here. That kind of intrigued me, but anyway. Um, road design has certain 
standards that we need to stick with in site development. Three classifications, collector, industrial, and miner. As an example, discuss, we're going to look at miners. So right away is 50 feet. That's a standard. Pavement width, 28 feet. With curbs, 28 feet without. Shoulder widths without curbs, 4 feet. A sidewalk width is 5 feet. These are all design standards that we need to incorporate into our drawings. Minimum angle of an intersection, 60 degrees. The minimum radius of an intersection is a 30 foot radius. That's this red arc right here. The minimum center line on curves is 150 feet radius. The minimum tangent between curves is 50 feet. Anything less than that, then you're whipping your steering wheel back and forth, depending on how fast you're going. But the minimum um, uh, distance between curves to the tangent is 50 feet. Intersections. Minimum distance between intersections on the same side of the street is 300 feet. Opposite side of the street is 150 feet. Now that's pretty easy to accept because most, if you've got buildings that are back to back, uh, generally you'd have at least 150 feet because most lots are at least 90 or 70 or 100, you know, 100 feet. So if I had another um, intersection down here, 300 feet is not out of the question. For an intersection. Sight distance at intersection is 10 feet per mile per hour of speed limit. Uh, so if it's, uh, it's a 50 mile per hour uh, zone, then you would need 50 feet of sight distance at the intersection to be able to see in either direction. Dead end streets, some standards. Maximum length is 1,200 feet for dead end street. The minimum, anything beyond 1,200 feet, you'd need an, another exit out of the street. So a dead end street, maximum length 1,200 feet. Minimum radi, radius of a cul-de-sac is 80 feet. Uh, you can see that down here. 70 feet right away, 55 feet of pavement ends up with a right away arc is uh, 50 foot minimum radius. Allowable road grades, rise and run, is 1%. Uh, actually, this is just the formula. One foot per 100 feet is a 1.01 or 1% rise and run. The minimum is 0.5%. The maximum is 8%. Here's the crown. If we're looking at the cross section of a road, in order to allow for water to drain properly, the minimum crown is one quarter inch per foot, and I put in non-accumulating. In other words, if you've got a 28 foot road and you've got 14 feet to the center, you can't get all of your rise over the first foot and then uh, take the rest of the 14 as flat. It needs to be a consistent crown at one quarter inch per foot, non-accumulating, so it gives you a nice even slope. Bicyclists, motors, camp carpenters, roofers, and others need to calculate slope at least must have some understanding of it. Slope, tilt, and inclination can be expressed in three ways. As a ratio, when we look at roof slopes, for instance, um, a normal ranch style roof, a carpenter would refer to as a 612 pitch. In other words, for every 12 inches horizontally, that roof would go up 6 inches. A 12-12 pitch would be a 45 degree angle, which is a little steep to walk on. So a normal uh, cape type roof may be an 8-12. 12-12s, again, are a little steep, but an 8-12, uh, for every 12 inches horizontally, it goes up 8 inches. You can almost walk on it. Some people can. I can't. The other way to uh, talk about uh, ang uh, is in an angular description as in 45 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, we can get a slope in that method. So we have rise and run, 512, 612, 812, angle, 45 degrees, 60 degrees. Most civil engineers in the road work use percentages called the grade, and it's the rise 
divided by the run times 100. Now, as an example, I put this chart in here and it's a little out of whack because this is more like a 45 degree angle, but because I stretched it to fit in here. We can see that this angle starting at zero up to here would be a one inch per hundred feet or one percent uh, grade. A one in 12, one inch every 12 would be an 8.33 percent grade. So let's imagine, sometimes it's not always 100, let's imagine you've got 70 feet of road and it rises, uh, let's say it rises uh, over 70 feet, let's say it rises 0.8 feet. So I'm going to, uh, I don't know whether I can grab my, let's see if I can grab my calculator. Bring it over here so you can see it. Hopefully we're still recording. Yep. Um, so we said we had a 70 foot. Actually, we got a 0.8 foot rise divided by 70 feet equals. And then we multiply. It's 0 0.01142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142857142
many years ago and now we have to deal with it. Um, we have found an old bunch of oil drums in the ground. Uh, anything can happen uh, unforeseen and you need to be ready to handle those situations. Um, a lot of times you have a budget that includes a contingency which is basically a percentage of your construction costs that is there just to cover unforeseen conditions and change orders. Uh, the biggest issue with implementation is an owner changing his mind on some part of the design uh, once you're into the construction because then it becomes very expensive to, to change uh, because you've already got your contracts out there. Uh, and most importantly, maintain communications. If, uh, if something's going wrong, um, make sure that you don't stick your head in the sand and avoid it. You need to make sure that you communicate things quickly, uh, make sure that everybody's on board and uh, get issues resolved as quickly as possible. Letting them ferment does not make them any go away or become any better. Uh, they become more difficult to deal with the longer you wait. And here's a real example of a site plan that is put together for residents and uh, some of the things I can't see the whole plan but I can identify some things we can see these round items with uh, uh, center marks are trees and shrubs the blue lines are new contours these blue arrows are slope directions this yellow dashed line if you can see it is actually setbacks so from the property line it's required that there's a certain setback so the engineer has drawn that line for setbacks all the way around the property and the owner because it's a relatively small lot has determined that they want to maximize the biggest structure they can on this footprint so you can see this roof overhang this dotted purple line on the outside is where the maximum distance it can go so you're putting your roof overhang right on the maximum setback for the property so the distance from your property line right here to this area this corner is right at the minimum or maximum distance that you can or minimum distance you can be set back from your property line out here it looks like part of a cul-de-sac goes down heritage avenue uh, we can see the curb in this double blue line that runs around here We've got some elevations here. We've also got some existing, these look like they're uh, property uh, stakes, some iron pins in the ground. And we've taken that iron pin and we've made a distance calculation of 36.3 feet from that pin to this corner of the building. And from this pin to that same corner is 69 feet. So when a person is laying out their building they can take two tape measures two um, tapes bring one out to 69 feet and one to 36.3 and where those two tapes meet would be the corner of your building on the drawing you can actually swing an arc and from this one swing another arc and where those arcs intersect is going to be the the intersection of the corner of your roof overhang and they've done the same thing down here where we've got two dimensions from known points to identify the location of where this building needs to be on the on the ground so easily without survey equipment if you've got known points and you can swing two distances off these you can locate the points of your setbacks easily on your building here's our garage with a finished floor elevation of 69.34 and our uh, porch elevation at 70.42 and our basement elevation at 62.25, our first floor elevations at 71.00. We've got a deck that also extends right to the edge of the setback area. And you can see probably if they didn't have to deal with that, they would have squared this deck up originally. We've got a foundation drain running in this direction to the municipal um, uh, invert, and this is an invert at 59.5. Uh, we've got a water main coming in. This dot here is probably the valve for that water main coming in from the road. It's going to come into the building here. Um, 
Can we see a sewer anywhere? I don't see the sewer line. This is existing topo, 69 feet, and the blue is the new. Oh, there's the sewer right in front of me. Water and sewer, both right in this location. So you got a clean out here, a water valve here, and those both run out to the municipalities. Our driveway pavement is all listed out here. Uh, coming in off the curb, so we're going to have a curb cut right in this location. So really, when you look at it, when you get used to looking at these things, these are pretty easy to interpret. Our total for lot one is 14,433 square feet. Uh, so it's easy, again, to calculate that using the property outline and using the computer, the CAD system, to just make that into a shape and create the um, uh, the, the uh, square footage or even run it into acres if you need to. And uh, again, topo lines are here, shows our slopes, everything's laid out. And that is it for this week. That's probably enough. So uh, be ready for a little quiz. I'm going to uh, put all of the PDF files up on the screen when we're, when we're done.